Good morning, party people. It's 6 a.m. in California. I'm out here dropping off one of the cars for service, and there are no restaurants open yet at 6 a.m., so I uh, figured I'd spend some time with y'all this morning answering your data platform questions. If you've got any questions about the Microsoft Data Platform, feel free to leave them at the URL in the video description. First up, we have Kebros, Kebr kind of like Kerberos, Kerberos, but different. Kebros says, hi Brent, my manager wants me to summarize SQL Server Health into a number between one and 100 for all 50 production SQL servers. This is idiotic, but just for banter, and that's his, that's him saying. I actually don't think it's idiotic. Uh, but just for banter, what health metric would you advise me to use and average out, even if it doesn't paint a whole picture, so that I can feed my family? Well, you said health, and to me, I think that's a great use for SP Blitz. I know as a database administrator, it can be frustrating to say, you know, how am I doing overall? I love using the number of high priority warnings out of SP Blitz. And for, for me, so the first thing that you get when you run SP Blitz in the first column is a priority, and it goes from 1 to 255. I consider high priority anything under 50, so like 1 to 49. Count up the number of uh, uh, failure alerts that you have between 1 and 49, and I would use that as part of your grading. For example, maybe you start at 100, and for every high priority warning you find, you take off 10 points or one point. It's up to you how you want to do that. Um, but for me, that's a really good health number. When you say things like I.O., that's more of a performance number. People don't usually get fired for slow performance. They get fired for losing data, like corruption, security problems, etc. So that's the place where I would start. Next up, we have SwissDBA asks, Hi Brent, I inherited a database of about 2 terabytes with 355 data files. <laughs> that's, a, that's a high number. How would you check and prove to the business if the database has too many data files? Even the biggest file is just 55 gigabytes in size, and I believe the database could be faster with much less data files. Why? Why do you believe that? What gave you that idea? The problem with where you're going is, it feels like a, I feel like. You didn't start with a, a weight type, like what's the top weight type facing the server. You didn't look at how you've been working on solving that weight type. You just picked a number that you think is going to be easy to fix. I, I see that same problem out of people, for example, who focus on page life expectancy or fragmentation. It looks like a number that's going to be easy to fix, and they understand that number, so they think that fixing that will somehow magically make performance better. I don't think it will. In your case, I don't think lowering data files is going to make the database faster. Now, there are advantages to having less database files. For example, if you have to keep free space in every single one of them, that causes you management heartache because they all have a whole lot of free space lying around for no reason. The other problem with where you're going with this is, say that it, you could fix it and it would make the database, let me just make up a number, 1% faster. How are you going to fix it? Fixing it is a logged operation. For every one of the data files that you want to empty out and move to other data files, that's a fully logged operation. It's going to make everything slower while it's happening. It's going to blow up your transaction logs. It's going to make log shipping slower. Always on availability groups is going to have to copy that uh, those changes across. Even if you thought it would actually make a difference, the bang for the buck on that is so small, I think you're going down the wrong uh, tree. Going up the wrong tree, marking down the wrong path, you're wrong. <laughs> um, next up, Brittany says, what are the most common strategies that you see used for recovering from oops queries? Okay, so if someone does an oops query, they do a delete without a where clause, they do an update without a where clause, they do a deployment that fails, whatever. One of the easiest ways to work around it is log shipping with a delay. 
you can put a delay on the log shipped secondary to be say 30 minutes behind or 60 minutes behind so that if you move quickly you can hop over to that secondary server and the data will still be there from before the accident it won't get you right up to the point of the transaction but at least it gets you a lot of your data back quickly if you want to get as close as possible up to the exact transaction, that's where third-party backup tools come in. Uh, things like Quest Lightspeed, uh, Idera SQL Safe, Redgate SQL Backup. And some of those have the ability to restore uh, individual tables, pluck individual tables out of backups, whereas native backups do not. Next up, Life Extinguisher says, uh, can RCSI improve backup speed? No. Uh, considering backups reads, so he goes into some detail there about uh, trying to deal with locking and reads. So here's the deal, RCSI causes storage to do more writes. Because after all, we have to keep track of that stuff over in the version store, right? So doing more writes doesn't make backups faster. If you are worried about making backups faster, go Google Brent Ozar faster SQL Server backups, and I've got a post that explains how you measure the reads, how you measure the compression, and how you measure the writes. That is where the pot of gold is at at the end of that rainbow. Uh, Susudio, oh, nice shout out to an excellent Phil Collins song. Susudio says, what tools or techniques do you recommend for generating large pseudo-realistic synthetic data loads? Okay, so there's no such thing as pseudo-realistic synthetic data. If you could make up data that matches what your users have, you can't predict how creative your users are, what kinds of outliers you have. So what you basically end up doing is writing down all of the outliers that you have in your real data and then building your own data generation in order to match those outliers. Stack Overflow data is a great example. So in Stack Overflow data, there are some truly outlier users. User ID zero, I believe, is the community user uh, that is uh, all kinds of, has all kinds of robot, robot activity associated with it. Uh, so has a ton of uh, edits or owned posts, but doesn't actually do a lot of activity, like doesn't cast votes. Or, um, there are other outlier users like, say, John Skeet, who answers all kinds of questions. You have to go through and analyze all the outliers in your data. There's no magic tool that you're going to be able to just push a button and it's going to be able to come up with data that matches yours. It says, uh, for performance testing in the lower SQL environments, it just doesn't work that way. Now, you can come up with your own synthetic data by all means. You can, there are all kinds of random, da jada, jada, random data generator tools out there. But at that point, you're also random generating the performance numbers that come out of it. If you're just looking for random numbers that don't need to match your workload, just go use things like the TPC benchmarks. But otherwise, it just doesn't work that way. Uh, next up, Dilara asks, when are SQL Server questions better suited for Stack Overflow versus database administrators.stackexchange.com? If it's about T-SQL programming, how do I write a query that delivers this result, or how do I design a table to achieve this objective? Stack Overflow is a programming site. Go there. If it's about how do I administer a server, how do I do backups, how do I configure this feature, how do I troubleshoot an outage, that is better suited for dba.stackexchange.com. And you don't have to really overthink it too badly because uh, when moderators see something that's on completely the wrong site, they have the ability to move a question quickly and easily from one site to another. Um, Lieutenant Dan asks, what are the top four SQL conferences ranked in order? Ooh, oh, that's tricky. N normally I don't like ranking in order because it's, it's kind of a, an opinion question. But I will tell you, number one by far and away is the one you can get to. Don't hold out, don't wait another you know, year of your career thinking, well, I have to wait until I can attend this one. 
go attend one that's near you whether it's a SQL Saturday, a Data Saturday, anything that's available near you, go to one as soon as you practically can because networking with other people will start to advance your career. So number one is the one that you can get to. For me, number two would probably be SQL Bits. I adore the SQL Bits conference in the UK. I think they do a really good job of organizing it. The volunteers are heroic. They put on a great party. They do a good job of curating schedules. Um, I really, really like that conference. Um, number uh, three for me would be the PASS Summit. Uh, PASS, the Professional Association for SQL Servers, it used to be known and they just changed it to PASS. They went down a whole misguided thing and went bankrupt. Uh, they got bought out or rescued basically by Redgate Software. So this year will be the first year that Redgate's doing it in person again in Seattle. The PASS Summit is, has been uh, historically the largest SQL Server conference. And of course, with the reboot after COVID, you know, everything's up in the air. We'll see how those things go. Uh, but I'm very excited to attend that in November in Seattle. Um, I, I, for me, SQL Bits is above that because it, the volunteers are heroic. The, the conference is amazing. It has a real family feel to it. Um, whereas uh, the PASS Summit feels a little bit more commercial. Uh, uh, than the SQL Bits does. Uh, so th those are my top three that I would go from there. Uh, Fyodor, Fyodor asks, uh, good to see you again, Fyodor. Um, what is your opinion or experience with using client-side profilers like the C-Sharp Mini Profiler to monitor SQL query performance? I like it. Uh, I like tools like that a lot. I have no experience using them myself outside of a consulting capacity telling developers you should probably play with tools like this to get a better handle on what your uh, performance looks like. It's especially true with software as a service apps who put every client in their own database and often spread those across lots of SQL servers. Monitoring software can be expensive. And if you're using uh, hosting platforms like Azure SQL DB, Amazon RDS, it's really easy to spin up a whole bunch of SQL servers that can be expensive to monitor. And if you don't need to monitor things like backups on things like Azure SQL DB, where they do the backups for you, or uptime or reliability, where it's Microsoft's problem, not yours, uh, then tools like the Mini Profiler let developers capture performance metrics across all clients, across all servers, relatively inexpensively. Do I use them for trouble performance troubleshooting? No, other than to walk developers through, here's the website on how it works. If you want to pay me to read the documentation to you, I can be the world's most expensive narrator. Probably not the world's most expensive, uh, but good developers are able to catch on to that pretty quickly. Does basically anything asks, hi Brant, regarding SP Database Restore, I was wondering if you knew of anyone who wrote something open source that uses it for automating testing restores for multiple servers, multiple databases. No, nothing that I would know of offhand. One thing though, if you're working towards automating uh, stuff across a lot of SQL servers, go look at dbatools.io. DBATools.io is a PowerShell a framework of all kinds of things that production database administrators need to do on a regular basis across lots of servers. Uh, so I, I don't think it's going to be a kind of point, set it and forget it, like you can feed in a list of servers and it automatically knows where the backups are at and how to restore them and what the schedule should be. But it's the closest thing to a toolkit to help you build that kind of thing. And the uh, user community around there is really strong. Like they're very helpful and uh, will go out of their way to point you towards resources that uh, they can help you avoid reinventing the wheel. Uh, next up, Happy DBA says, do you have a video of the baby sea turtles yet? 
It is mid-August and I went down to Cabo a couple of weeks ago and it was a little too early. There were, so I have a place on the beach in Cabo San Lucas, Mexico. And uh, it's on a beach where baby turtles uh, are, baby turtle eggs hatch. They climb out of the sand and go down to the ocean every morning. And it was just a little bit too early. Each morning I would go down there and walk the beach and there would only be one or two uh, turtle, baby turtle tracks. And they had made it successfully into the ocean. So uh, probably if I go down there again in two or three more weeks, I'll be able to get a bunch of videos of uh, baby sea turtles. We'll do one more. Uh, Haydar asks, what are your preferred scripts or tools for monitoring always on latency? Go buy a third party tool. Go buy a third, third party monitoring tool and call it a day. Uh, third party monitoring tools give you nice dashboards. They give you alerting built in. They're great for teams to use as opposed to somebody's janky script. Now, I just got done telling you about dbatools.io. That's absolutely wonderful in terms of getting things done. It's not for long-term alerting, like making sure that things are working. There are people who've written things like uh, pester test frameworks that will go through and run tests against your SQL servers uh, and tell you if they fail, but that's more targeted towards configuration. It's less targeted about real-time alerts like when your AG synchronization stops working. You need to know quickly because it's only a matter of minutes before you blow your RPO and RTO. Don't try to reinvent that wheel in the year 2022. Go get a third party monitoring tool. And the way that I propose it when I'm building new servers as I just say, here's a list of everything that's involved in building this new server. The SQL server licensing costs this much, the hardware costs this much, my monitoring tools cost this much. Because when managers see the total cost, their eyes are immediately gravitated towards uh, whatever's the largest number in that list, which is usually the SQL server licensing cost by a long shot. Uh, so then if they go, oh, we gotta get the cost down on here, I can go, great. I need you to work with Microsoft on our renewal costs. They're coming up on this date. See what you can do. If you can even just get it down by 1%, that would be a pretty significant gain. Oh, okay. Whereas if they're looking at the smaller numbers on that list, I can't really make that big of a difference on there. Uh, that, that seems to help management understand that these are the costs of doing business. If you want to cut one, go cut the big one. Don't try to cut the little tiny ones. All right, there we go. There's a good round of questions for the morning. I am, it's about 6.30 now. I'm gonna go head over to the uh, restaurant and go get myself some, this particular hotel has smoked salmon fish pancakes. It's a really cute play on lox and bagel. They have little uh, pancakes shaped like goldfish. And then uh, they put on alongside there uh, salmon, capers, uh, cheese. And so you make your own little uh, kind of lox and bagel, but with fish pancakes, which is kind of cute. So I will see you all at the next office hours. Adios, everybody. <laughs>